Good morning. Good morning. This is a very special morning. You'll have to forgive me, I've been sick. So, This is a very special morning in the life of First Plymouth Congregational Church. We've welcomed new members into the life of our congregation. And in addition, we are officially welcoming a new non-human, yet very present contributor and servant to the life, membership, and experience of our worship at First Plymouth Congregational Church. From the generous gift of Jim and Marion Woodward, we have officially installed the Rogers 361 Infinity Platinum Organ, complete with 10, 20 channels of premium audio. Running in conjunction with that instrument and also installed within the organ is a MIDI, or Musical Instrument Digital Interface, sound module, the Roland XV 2020, which grants the organ an additional 1,200 sounds of extreme variety. And this has all been fused in seamless working relationship with our existing physical acoustic Reuter pipe organ of 44 ranks. We started this project in January of 2016, and on July 4th of the same year, the organ was officially employed into its first Sunday morning service. The potentials and the excitement of this instrument have already begun to speak for themselves. The pioneering manner in which the organ already contributes to the life of worship at First Plymouth is absolutely consistent with a worship that always aims towards an overarching me message of God is still speaking. So while we officially re rededicate this instrument to the community and to the worship life of First Plymouth Congregational Church, we also need to recognize a few key individuals who really made this possible. And Jim and Marion Woodward were, I, I got a call after or, or four days or so before Christmas and Marion said, Jim and I would like to make a donation and we'd like to get that new instrument you've talked about. And I thought, okay, that's nice. And I thought that we'd start a seed fund. I had no idea that she meant, no, we're gonna do it. And so, Jim and Marion, would you please stand? I think I saw you over here. And let us recognize you. Chris Harris worked with Harry Bennett and myself uh, a lot in this project. He has run an insane amount of cabling and wiring from this end of the church to that end of the church up there where you see some speakers, and, and has done a lot of apparatus construction for relay boards and whatnot. Is Chris in the, in the room this morning? I didn't see him. Okay, he's not here. And Harry Bennett um, is the uh, Rogers dealer extraordinaire um, who has brought a wealth of knowledge in configuring and setting up the organ. He's made it communicate with our current acoustic instrument and continues to help me make it sound completely awesome from the keyboard. And I did see Harry, so where is Harry? Can we recognize him? So thank you all for making this happen, and First Plymouth really gets to reap the benefit of this for many, many years. But that brings me to the topic of this morning, and that really is music, especially music in the church. So what is music, and why do we do it? I mean, <clears throat> really, it's just pretty sounds for our aural entertainment, or filler when we can't stand the uncomfortable silence in our daily work or spiritual lives. Consciously or subconsciously, to many of us, Music is a distraction from the mundane. It fills the gaps of our boredom. It is an escape from our own minds. Good music pleases us, entertains us, makes us tap our foot or sing along, mumbling maybe some of the words. Good music has a catchy tune. It's harmonious. Good music is never too loud. or too soft, and is only composed for the instruments we personally enjoy. Good music is only performed or sung by the people we deem good musicians, which also is an extension of our own personal judgment of music. Good music is always happy. It makes us feel good. It drowns out our troubles. 
Good music allows us to leave church, a movie, a concert, or any given event saying, oh, that was so nice. <laughs> and surely, music's primary goal is to make sure we're having fun. Music is quarantined to the category of dessert for our ears. Music is always to be judged by the good old standard of, I like it or I don't like it. Really? Something that can crack our hardened hearts like a walnut within seconds is just filler for our daily life, menial entertainment for our drive-through fulfillment and pleasure. Just this week, I was sitting at home and the movie The Color Purple was on. It's one of my favorite movies. I truly believe the movie to be a work of art and Lord knows I've watched that movie from beginning to end many, many times. And if I can get through even just saying this. But every time one scene in particular arrives, I know I'm absolutely going to be wrecked with tears. Broken in half. I mean like slammed into a wall behind a truck wrecked. Every single time I see singer and clear sinner, Shug Avery, burst into that church, her daddy's church, in that bright yellow Easter looking dress, singing at the top of her lungs with all of her heart, God's trying to tell you something. With a full juke joint band marching and follow, straight to her daddy, who's estranged to her, and who is the pastor, who Suge has been banished from for a lifetime for being a sinner. And that daddy and pastor is now standing in the pulpit, completely ambushed by the display, and Suge sings again, God's trying to tell you something. Maybe God's trying to tell you something now, right now, right now, right now. The scene concludes with Suge and her daddy, the pastor, in a long, long overdue embrace, with tears flowing from both, with the music playing on in the same refrain, God's trying to tell you something. And then Suge says in the embrace into her daddy's ear, See, daddy, sinners have soul too. In these moments, I ask, who cannot know the relevance of the Spirit or of God? You see, music isn't a material. It can't be weighed or measured, accounted for. It can't be seen, touched, grabbed, held, or stored in a box for future use. Now, yes, we can grab and play a musical instrument. We can store away hundreds of boxes of sheet music. We can organize our vinyl records, our eight-track tapes, our compact cassettes, our CD collections, or our iTunes. If you millennials missed a few of those words, just ask somebody what an eight-track tape is after church. <laughs> but the point is, those are all just tools, contraptions, machines, storage devices that if put into use, generate the invisible, the intangible sound. Generally, Music is inspired in its composition by a composer and its soulful delivery of the performer. The Greeks believed music to be related to the study of astronomy. Astronomy, of course, to them was the study of all things that could be observed, all things external, and how they function in relationship. Music was seen as the study of things that were invisible, the study of the internal, non-observable objects. Think about that for just one second. What is an internal, non-observable object? How many non-observable objects do you have in your life? Go ahead, think about it. Now, I'm not trying to say that non-observable objects don't exist, actually quite the opposite. But somehow, unconsciously, we all banish them to the woo-woo, the magical we quickly decide that they are a little less important, a little less valuable, and certainly they aren't scientific, and they hold less commodity than other things. Here's the most incredible part of this musical object. We can't live without it. We simply take for granted that this invisible object will be there. 
It will be on the alarm clock that wakes us up. It will be on the TV. It will fill the sand soundtrack of our work days. It will be in our cars. It will be at the place we eat lunch. It will be on the video game we play. It will be present from beginning to end of the movie we go see for entertainment. It will be in our church. It will be in our home. It will be in the songs of the birds flying around us in the air. It will, it will be at all the most important steps of our life from beginning to end. Music will be sung by people at our first birthday. It will be at our graduations. It will be at our weddings. It will be with us in the hospital. And it will capstone the end of our lives in our memorials for others in our deaths. This non-observable object will be with us our entire life. This non-observable object exists throughout the entire world, has existed in every human culture, and has been present throughout all of human history. Why I ask you, then, what is the relevance of this non-observable object that every single one of us experiences each and every day of our life, regardless of whether we pay attention to it or not? In 1940, the famous French organist Olivier Messiaen composed one of the most profound musical compositions ever. The piece titled The Quartet for the End of Time was composed while Messiaen was being held as a prisoner of war in a Nazi war camp. The story goes that a Nazi soldier understood Messiaen as a musician and supplied Messiaen with a place to compose and simple supplies such as paper and pen. While in the war camp, Messiaen had met several other instrumental players, among them a clarinetist, a violinist, and a cellist. For these three instruments, Messiaen composed. In 1941, while still in the war camp, this piece of music was performed for the first time for the prisoners and for the soldiers at the camp. It's now one of the most famous works in all classic repertoire. We all know the horrors of Nazi camps. We all know that survival was primary concern. In a Nazi war camp, just hoping for food and not getting a torturous physical abuse would have been consumed in daily life. So why music? Why waste time on something so invisible, not necessary, and not worth anything? In 2001, I was on my way to practice the organ at my church in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. I began to hear of the horrific events that were taking place in New York City, and I heard on the radio while driving of the plane slamming into the World Trade Center. I quickly called my mom and dad and told them that I feared this might be the end. I, I mean, I really believed, oh my God, the nuclear warheads, they're going to be released. I told my parents I loved them. But I wasn't far from the church, so I continued on my destination. As I walked into the church, the staff had plugged in a large TV in the main office, and we stood there in total silence towards each other, watching it all play out on TV. The eeriness of seeing the towers come down was unreal. The starkness of it all, the lack of hope, the lack of control, the disbelief, the hope that as the smoke cleared, we'd see something still standing. The devastation, the complete disregard for our humanity was on display for the entire world to see. And yet, there was no soundtrack. There were no crescendos to paint the moment. There were no violins or drums heightening the drama unfolding. No brass furiously playing terrifying unison lines. No flutes or piccolos or oboes flying quickly and panicked, fleeting flourishes at the top of their registers. No 200 voice men's choirs seeing pulsing, terrifying lines of chant in Latin. And as both towers were downed, there was no section of French horns signifying the loss and defeat through haunted melodies. As the events were completed that morning, the confusion and disorientation set in for everyone. I was supposed to go and practice on the organ. I went into the church, turned the organ on, played a few bars, and realized there was no way I could make music. I packed my bag and I left the church. I didn't make music that week hardly at all. It seemed purposeless. 
Later that week, on Friday, I was invited to sing with a mass choir of conservatory trained musicians, since I was still a student at the conservatory in Cincinnati. A massive orchestra and a massive choir of nearly 200 voices was organized. We all volunteered, wanted to be part of something good, something beautiful, and we all volunteered to give a command performance of the Brahms Requiem. If you've never heard the Brahms Requiem, you need to do that someday. With preparation time very short for such a large work, also to be sung in German, let's just admit it was a far from perfect performance of the work and that it was far under par in its normal delivery from such trained musicians of all disciplines. Yet it tore into every heart, every musician and singer, everyone in attendance, and every soul was opened up, naked, vulnerable, on display for each other and for God. Our invisible, non-observable inner objects, our souls, were fully visible. We're in relationship with each other in a manner the likes of which I've only seen a few times in my life, and certainly not in that number. Across the nation, people sang hymns and songs of hope in huge number. America the Beautiful, We Shall Overcome, and other hymns of hope rang across the nation. Music was being generated from all people, not just musicians. We were all yearning for something spiritual, something that could connect us to each other and to God. Concert halls and churches were filled to capacity with services offering the greatest music. The first public events organized as salve to our griefs were concerts. These concerts granted us hope in a time of great despair. While the military secured our nation, our airports, healing and recovery, ointment for our souls, was first being done with music. I'd like to share a quote with all of you. This quote comes from a welcome address to the incoming students of Dr. Paul, Dr. Carl Polnack to the Boston Conservatory of Music. It begins, if we were a medical school and you were here as a med student practicing appendectomies, you'd take your work very seriously because you would imagine that some night at 2 a.m. someone is going to waltz into your emergency room and you're going to have to save their life. Well, my friends, someday at 8 p.m., someone is going to walk into your concert hall and bring you a mind that is confused, a heart that is overwhelmed, and a soul that is weary. Whether they go out whole again will depend partly on how well you do your craft. You're not here to be an entertainer, and you don't have to sell yourself. The truth is, you don't have anything to sell. Being a musician isn't about dispensing a product. I'm not an entertainer. I'm a lot closer to a paramedic, a firefighter, or a rescue worker. You're here to become a sort of therapist for the human soul, a spiritual version of a chiropractor, someone who works with the insides to see if they can get things to line up, to see if we can come into harmony with ourselves and be healthy and happy and well." End quote. Music is not entertainment. Music is not for our own personal entitled pleasure or judgment. Music is not a luxury. In our worship, in our sacred lives, in our personal lives, in our spirits, in the interest of our human non-observable objects, our souls. Music deserves more than what is left of and from us. Music is the divine communication that makes us understand the invisible, the intangible. It allows us to understand our lives, our humanity, when we have no vocabulary. It makes us understand, comprehend with our hearts, topics and feelings for which our minds are frankly inadequate. In short, 
Music is that invisible, intangible object which makes us know about, converse with, and have relationship with another invisible, inner, intangible object. And that other invisible, inner, intangible object is God. For the glory of God alone, soli Deo Gloria.